It's a great honor and big pleasure to introduce a very special guest at Lucifer. Uh, Frank Ferrara from Bang is with us tonight. Hi, Frank, and welcome to Contra Radio. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, Bang is a band that is pretty familiar to the listeners of this show because it happens often here to listen to songs of this great band from the early 70s. And Frank is the bassist uh, and singer of the band from the original lineup of Bang, right? Yes, I am. Okay. The original bass player and singer. So, Frank, you'll be soon touring Europe. And we will talk about it later. But first, I would like uh, you to tell us something about the roots uh, of this band. And I think that it could be a, a good way to introduce the band, going back to what maybe can be considered the real starting point of your career. And that would be probably the show in Orlando in 1971, uh, when you played in the same stage of Rod Stewart and Deep Purple. So would you tell us what happened exactly that crucial day? Oh, Lucille. We left, we left Philadelphia in a trailer and a station wagon three days before the Rod Stewart show in, in Deep Purple, and we were uh, headed down to Florida. We really had no place to go. We had our equipment, and um, we stopped, actually. If you want the real truth, we, uh, we had gotten some marijuana, and we needed to buy some rolling papers. So we were in Daytona Beach, which was maybe two, three hours from Orlando, and we went into a record store to buy some rolling papers, and uh, there was a, a poster on the wall that said, Battle of the Bands. Uh, and so we asked the guy behind the counter if, you know, where that was, because we wanted to play the show. And he said, you know what? He says, he said that's an old poster. He said that, was, uh, that show was last week. Uh, so we did, but he says, you know, if you guys have a band, you know, uh, Deep Purple and Rod Stewart are playing in Orlando. Why don't you go there? Maybe they'll let you play. So uh, we spent the night in a tent that night, and we're drinking some beer and just talking and talking. And we decided, yeah, what the hell? Why don't we go and see if we can play the show? So we got up the next day, Lucille, drove to Orlando, and basically just pulled behind the venue where the show was and walked in, knocked on the door, and, and said, uh, this guy came out. We said, look, we're bang. We're from Philadelphia. Uh, we're the best effing band in the world. We want to play tonight. And uh, he basically said, set up your stuff if you have it. And we talked our way into opening up for Deep Purple and, and uh, the Small Faces. Basically, you know... Everything in life is about timing, and you know we, uh, you know, 72 hours before the show, Lucille, we were just driving to Florida in the U-Haul <laughs> with no idea what would happen. So we took a chance, and you know it was amazing. You know, here it is, you yes. know, opening up with uh, the original faces and the original Deep Purple. This was around 19. This was when Machine Head just came out. There, one well, of the bigger yeah. albums. Uh, you said it was a question of timing, but I think it came out from a mix of fate and boldness because you were really bold to force the hand of fate, so to say. Oh, Lucille, so we had to, because here's the thing. We, we rehearsed every night for 18 months. I mean, every night. We're talking seven days a week. Hmm. We were always together. Uh, we wrote, uh, we, we started learning how to write, but we became very tight, so... You know, we were three people as one, basically. And when we went to Florida, we were ready. You know, we really had believed in each other. And it's funny you say that because the promoter, the guy that answered the door, or, you know, the knock on the door, uh -huh. said that, you know, hey, man, you know, you, you guys got balls like this. You, got, you know, you guys have a – and you sound good. If you don't believe in yourself, Lucille, nobody else is going to believe in right. you. Right. That's the kind of attitude you have to project from the stage. You know, and I think you can tell that with most bands. You can tell if they really like each other or if they're just going through the motions, yeah. you know. And I think, you know, our music was good, thank you, God, but I think he saw our determination and, you know, our desire. You know, I think that's really, that was just as much of, of us getting that show than, you know, our music itself. Right, you know? right. What happened then? Because you made this gig and then after a brief time, you had a contract with the uh, Capitol Records. Okay, well, after the show, Lucille, Rick Bowen, who was the promoter of the show, uh, came back and he said, listen, he says, uh, you're going to Florida. 
you're going down to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, he said, I'm doing a show with Steppenwolf next week. You guys mm-hmm. want to open up the show? And we were, like, excited because, you know, we did a good job. We see, we played while the people were coming in. The, the lights were still on. Okay. And the stage, we had about two feet left on the stage. It was a very small thing. <laughs> but after the show, he says, you guys did really well. How would you like to do a show with Steppenwolf next week? So basically right away, he took a, an interest in us and, and, you know, said, look, I have a hotel in Fort Lauderdale. I'm, you know, you guys can stay there. And we waited a week, Lucille, and then we drove up to Steppenwolf, Richmond, to do the show with Steppenwolf. And after that, he asked if we, you know, wanted to do another show with Guess Who. And at that point, uh, when we stayed at the hotel in Fort Lauderdale, there was a a studio there, a Criteria studio, uh, which went on to be one of the bigger studios at that time. And we went in and did our, our demo of Death of a Country, which was what we were working on for 18 months in the basement. And, uh... So basically, within the Small Faces concert, we did two or three more shows. We did a demo, and then Capitol and uh, Atlantic Records were both interested in the band. So within two or three months, we, you know, we were in the studio. Since that for the initial show, we were in the studio, did our record, our, our Death of a Country record, and we're waiting to see if we wanted to go with Capitol or yeah. Atlantic. It doesn't sound like you had an idyllic partnership uh, with Capitol. In fact, Capitol Records decided not to release Death of a Country. So what happened with Capitol and what were the reasons behind this decision? Capitol Records at the time was very middle of the road. Yeah. You know, Atlantic had all the, the hard rock groups. You know, they had the Zeppelin and they had everybody that was yeah. heavy. And Capitol was more of a um, contemporary label. And they were just getting ready to lose Grand Funk Railroad. And basically they came back and and told us that they didn't feel that a debut album, um, a concept album like Death of a Country, uh, would be you know commercial enough to put out. Now the only reason we went with Capitol Lucille is because the Beatles were on Capitol, you know, <laughs> and they were our heroes. <laughs> and you know we didn't, and we were kids. We were 18 years old. We didn't really, we trusted everybody at that age. So we thought Capitol Records would would do right by the band. But what was happening is. They didn't believe in Death of the Country, so they gave us two weeks to write another album. And at that point, they sent a producer down, and and he said, you know, they don't want to release Death of the Country. It's you know, they, they, they think it'll go over everybody's head, you know. And so we were disillusioned. But you know, what do we know? We're the musicians. We we trusted them. It, it's your record company. You sign with them. You trust them because uh, as a musician, you never know. You never know the business side of music, right. which is nothing like you know the, the real side of music. Yeah, in fact, you were f- kind of, I don't know if to say this word, but forced to change a lot because Death of a Country is more of a, a spiritual, eco-friendly, psychedelic concept album with some hard rock, while the same title uh, debut is more hard rock, if I could say more Black Sabbath style. So you, sure, you had to sure. change a lot. Well, you know... Lucio, it's funny you say that, because back back in the 70s, every band did an album, they did two albums a year, so uh, you you only had six months in between recordings be- before you recorded another record, so, you know, we had two weeks to write the Bang album, which in my mind wasn't a whole lot of time, but we did it, you know, we did it, because we, we knew we could write songs, and You know, but it's still at that time, Capital was trying to make us more commercial, more commercial, more commercial. So mm-hmm. after Death of a Country, after we did that in the studio, they rejected it. You know, they basically, we had to write a whole different style of music. And so our inf- they used to call us a grand black Zeppelin. They said we sounded like grand funk, black Sabbath, and Led Zeppelin, <laughs> all rolled into one. You know, and to me it was like, wow, if, if, if we're that good, we should be bigger than the Beatles, you know. But <laughs> isn't that Grand Black Zeppelin? I thought that was fun. But, you know, we were we were writing all different kind of, kinds of music, Lucille, and Capitol was trying to make us commercial. They wanted us top 40 hits, and they, they kept giving us the pressure, you know, we need a hit record, we need a hit record. We weren't a top yeah. 40 band. We were a concert band, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We I were understand. a band you came to you know, see a show and... You know, we didn't have top, we didn't have hooks, we weren't Helen Reddy, we weren't, right. you know, that kind of a band. Right. We weren't the Raspberries, you know, but that's what Capital was trying to 
they kept you know sending us stuff and it was like why did we even sign with these guys if, if they didn't believe in our music and they're trying to change it why even why even sign it yeah it doesn't make much you know, sense it, it doesn't make any sense and that was one of the things where when we really learned that it's not the music business it's the business of music yes. it's like selling shoes it's not about heart you know when you write a song it's about heart it's about your, your spirit you know But that's not, you know, you got to sell records. It's like, well, how many are you going to sell? It's like shoes. That's what happened. We learned right away that this is not good. It was it was disillusioning because it, it just, it, it was like an oxymoron. You, you know, you think we went to Woodstock and we're all, it's like a happy feeling. You think everybody's your friend, da 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 mm -hmm. And then you find out that it's really not like that at all. This is about making money. Yeah. Yeah, we were we were shocked. They didn't want to re release Death of the Country, and it broke our heart because we really believe in it. And I always thought, wow, maybe if they did release Death of the Country, we would have never written the Bang album. And I mean, you know, what I mean, you don't know why things happen in life. But maybe we released <laughs> right. Death of the Country and it didn't do anything. But some way, the commercial ideas of Capitol Records succeeded because there was a time when Bang were quite. I, I would say famous because you were in the charts. Yeah, Questions, our first single, uh, was in the 40s on, on, on the charts. and In fact, it went to number two in Hong Kong, Lucille. It went to number two in Hong Kong, and it's like, you know, number two on the moon or something. You know? <laughs> Again, the business took over, and they stopped working that record. And uh, Lucille, to make the long story short, I think what happened with the band was six months after we signed with the label, Capitol Records got a new president, Okay. Our producer went to Epic Records. Everybody that was at the Capitol Tower in Hollywood that was behind our band was gone. So at that point, you had other producers, other, other, you know, other bands coming in. Uh -huh. and all the producers, they pushed their bands. They don't care about some other producer's band. It's like they, they need it. So they move on to something else. It's almost like, you know, okay, we work them for a couple months and let's move to something else. So... But uh, hey, I, I it never it never never mattered to us because I mean sure it was frustrating, but you know we knew we could write songs and, and we knew we were good and we we just try to keep the faith. You know that's what you got to do. Yeah. You got to face diversity and you just got to plow ahead because uh, like we talked about it before, if you don't believe it, nobody else will believe right. it. So right. you have to you have to do that in any in anything in life really. What about your last record with Capitol? It was uh, 1973 and it was called simply Music. It was more pop, melodic, some, somehow also Beatlesque record. What inspired Thank that you. change? <laughs> You're welcome, that's true. <laughs> No, we were always, we were always, uh, even on the, on the band record, Death of the Country, we, we always did a lot of harmony. Uh, you know, I think harmony and vocals are just as important as, you know, the instruments. Uh, so we, we kind of liked the two-part, three-part harmonies. The thing with music, that was our final thing with Capitol. After the Bang album, um, they basically made us change drummers. Uh, right before the Mother album, which was the second album. So we ended up recording the Mother album and the music album with a, a whole whole different drummer. And and what happened was the continuity, if things were getting worse and worse and worse and worse, so what happened was Capital, we did No Sugar Tonight by the Guess Who, yeah. just because Capital was pushing us to get a, a hit record. And by the time we did the music album, You know, we, we changed our sound, we, you know, we changed the style, because that basically we were trying to do what the label wanted us to do. And so we okay. got more commercial, more commercial, more commercial. <laughs> That's what happened. That's why the, the, the music album is so different. But hey, you know what? Bang was always uh, Tony DiOrio's lyrics, Frank Ilkin's guitar, and, and my melodies and my vocals. So I like that though, album very much. It's, it's yeah, very I mean, good. It's a very good album. Face, I think we have some great songs on that record. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, well, th thanks. You know, but but the people that liked the Bang album, which was much heavier, you know, thought we sold out by the music album. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't sound hard and heavy, and mm -hmm. Frankie's guitar wasn't in your face. Mm -hmm. It was more of a pop record, you know. But hey, for us, Lucille, I think if you try to sound the same on every record that you would get stale. And we were young. I think as musicians, you follow your talent where it takes you. And, you know, I don't want to make the same record over and over again. I mean, that would be boring. 
And back then it was fun just to write some different kinds of songs and, you know, to use the Mellotron and, you know, to do all those things back then. It was fun changing because mm -hmm. that's, that's what we evolved to. You know, not that we couldn't write anything heavy. That's just not the mood we were in that day, you know? I mean, that's what music is. Music is a mood, and, and you're in a different mood every half hour, right. you know? Okay, after many years, Death of a Country finally saw the light in 2004. It was reissued by Rise Above Records. Mm -hmm. How did the collaboration with the Rise Above start? Uh, okay, uh, Lee Dorian, who was, uh, I believe, part of the ownership uh, of that company, mm -hmm. approached us. He was an old Bang fan, and he said, look, you know, I'd love to do a box set of your records. And mm -hmm. by then we had... We just started playing again, and we, we were just, and we, it was a great idea. We wanted to, uh, we were very flattered by the fact that somebody wanted to do mm -hmm. a box set. And uh, Lee and Rise Above did a, you know, a great job on the box set. We were very happy with it. And uh, it basically came from Lee getting a hold of us, uh, getting a hold of our drummer, our lyricist, Tony DiOrio, and uh, we just struck a deal for, for them to, uh, you know, put a box set together. And it's a deluxe remastered CD set with uh, basically everything that you made, right? Yes, it was uh, our entire Capitol catalog. Okay, okay. Um, you are from Philadelphia. That was more into sweet soul music than into hard rock at that time. So how was that playing hard rock in Philadelphia in the 70s? You know, it was it was the same as it was in New York as it was in Florida. You know, you had a lot of bands that were, uh, if you liked hard rock music, that's the kind of music that you wrote. And as kids, you know, we we, we loved Black Sabbath. There's a lot of bands that we loved, mm -hmm. and you play those songs. And I guess in a way, uh, you know, a little bit of influence, you know, comes off. I mean, that's why we were, you know, compared to Black Sabbath a little bit because mm -hmm. we had that kind of style. But that just comes from you know, what you grow up with. You know, Philadelphia was known as a big, um, uh, kind of a soul kind of a town. You know, we yes. were hard rockers because we, we loved the cream and Jimi Hendrix. That's the kind of uh, music that we wrote. Learned a lot of different music, and then when we started writing music, whatever influences came in, you know, there bits and pieces of everybody you love, Lucille. You know, like you say, it sounds like the Beatles, or, you know, that was because... We love the Beatles, so if, if yeah. there's a little bit of something in each song, it reflects what your influences are. And and that's what we're finding out today. I mean, with the bang shows now, Lucille, we're playing in front of 20, 30-year-olds that weren't even born when we wrote this music. And for them to say, hey, you know, um, you inspired us to write music, it, mm -hmm. it reminds me of, you know, we were inspired by somebody when we started, so... You know, that aspiration turned into, you know, being part of our songwriting. We didn't have a, a Philadelphia style because we, we liked hard rock. We were a hard rock band. Well, actually, you're widely considered as forerunners of the doom metal genre. And how is I, it I, to be considered I, as, a, as, a, as a seminal band in that sense? You know what? Uh, whatever, whatever sense, you know, uh, our bang album went to the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame I mean, six months ago. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, it's like it just, just whatever genre or whatever mode it goes into, we're grateful for it because, you know, we're, I never s thought of us as a doom band because I thought we were always more of a rock and roll band. You know, a lot of doom is, is just doom. It's just sludge kind of stuff. We were more <laughs> about, I don't know, we had a groove. There was a difference in, in yeah. our music. But hey, That's true. if it's stoner rock, if it's, you know, acid rock, if it's hip hop, Whoever loves us, hey, I'm going to be grateful for it. But <laughs> to me, I don't, I don't see us as that kind of band because every album we did was different. You know, we didn't sound, we didn't stay in that vein, is what I should say. <laughs> you know, because yeah, we, right. we, we were being pushed by Capitol to, you know, be commercial and do something else. So, you know, they wanted because they expected the Bang record to take off and, you know, sell a million copies. <laughs> you know, and when it didn't, you know, they were trying to push us to be more commercial. And so we, we lost that thing, because back in 71, 72, uh, you know, hard rock was really obscure. You know, it wasn't radio-friendly, and everything was more on radio. They didn't even have FM radio back then. Everything was AM. So it was just the beginning of everything. We kind of got lost in the shuffle. But, uh, yeah, but very happy to be attached to stoner, doom rock, 
um, you know, we did a, a show, a tour with Pentagram, and our music fit right in with, with theirs, and people loved it, and, and that's good with us, you know. Uh, we're hoping to have the same kind of uh, response when we get to Europe, you know, in <laughs> April. So. so, after many years of silence, bang are back. On the 44th anniversary of your debut, uh, you will be on the road again. You are going to tour Europe, as you were saying, for the first time. Uh, so, why did you decide to, to bring the band back together and to be back on stage after all this time? Oh, good question. Uh, you know, I think uh, we were so young the first time around, and... Um, We had 40 years of uh, really nothing going on. Uh, we, we all kind of went our separate ways. And when we reformed, um, uh, you know, we, we started getting letters from, you know, once we put the website up, it, you know, we were getting fan letters, basically. And it made us realize that, you know, our music was still valid and we had an audience out there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, time had uh, went around. There were Frank Gilkin. Uh, Tony DiOrio and me, the mm -hmm. original three, um, basically the lines, the stars lined up. And we realized, you know what, our legacy is not done. You know, we hadn't seen each other in 25 years, and, you know, and in a week we wrote 15 songs. You know, so once you make magic with somebody, it never goes away. And I think when we got back together again uh, and realized that, you know, we still had a lot to offer, You know, we decided to go back and, and do what we love. You know, we're, we're musicians. We love to play. And at that point, you know, we uh, the buzz got out that we were back and we were able, lucky enough to, uh, you know, get a pentagram tour and, and get back out there. And that, that was our first tour in 42 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be out there playing again and realizing, wow, you know, people love our music. You know, that's what brought us back, mm -hmm. the fact that uh, the music is still strong and it's still original. And I think, you know, what goes around comes around. And I think uh, it was time that, you know, our music was just as good as anybody's. And we want to go play it and have fun. You know, that's, that's mm. why you're a musician. So that's what got us back together. Time, time had just lined up again to where uh, Frank Gilkin, you know, uh, had the time and, you know, and the, and the enthusiasm to uh, do it again. Because you have to have a lot of passion to do it mm -hmm. because... Uh, You know, that, that one hour that you play on stage is what you put up. That's, that's the reward for putting up with a lot of um, uh, trials and tribulations along the way. Uh, that's, that's really when, you, when a band has the most fun is when you're on stage playing for that hour. That's, that's what makes everything worth it. So basically, you know, we, we just want to finish what we started. Just uh, add on to our legacy and hopefully do a couple more records and uh, see where it goes. Before we're in the yeah. rock and roll heaven with David and Lemmy and all those. Yeah, it's terrible. Right it's getting it's getting really depressing what's happening this year. You know, they when I tell you we had 30 year olds coming out, I think I think this year old music is out, out selling, you know, new music. But I think the young people don't have what we had, you know, and and they appreciate it now because they don't have it. And you know what? I, I think it's a great thing because to me. The 60s, the 70s, you know, were, were the best era in music. Everybody had their brand. I mean, The Who was The Who. You know, Zeppelin right. was Zeppelin. There was nobody sounding like anybody else. Now you got a billion bands that, you know, you couldn't tell one from the other because they all sound the same. And That I really true. think the old age of music is really over with. I mean, I, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think we'll ever have, you know, the phenomenon of, of the Eagles or the Beatles or you know, bands that were Bowie, you know, who was just tremendous. I, I don't think that... I don't think that'll ever happen again, actually. No, no, it's finished. That era, I mean, yep. it's, it's really finished. Yeah, no, I so think that's why people go back to it. That's, that's what makes it attractive, because it's so original. Okay, the one in April will be your very first tour of Europe, uh, which will take you through the UK, Germany, France, Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Spain and Portugal, but no Italy. Ooh, I know, I know. So why I get that? That so good. I love the way you said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully the next tour hopefully this tour will go over there and kick ass and we'll be I want to play Italy my god it, yeah. I want to play everywhere we're, we're, we're like children at, at Christmas time Lucille I mean to finally be able we broke up right before we were scheduled to go to Europe uh, to go to the UK and do a, do a tour with Rod Stewart because we We played with him right when Maggie May became a hit and we broke up right before that and we were never able to go to Europe And I'll tell you, 
tell you what. Now, I mean, to be 62 years old, I'm getting the chance to do what I should have did when I was 20. And we're excited. I am so excited. I, I, I'm counting the days on the calendar until we get over there. Because uh, European fans are, are the most loyal, I think, yeah. of any fan. Uh, it's quite different in America because I think, you know, there's just so much going on here. Um, you know, at, at Italy or, or, or every place in Europe, the, the Europeans, they're more loyal. They still have the old values. They still have the old uh, virtues. Yeah, and, some uh, way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, some of them, yeah. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> it's the thrill of playing the people, you know, that you wouldn't see. I mean, to be in Germany and, you know, to be in Sweden and the Netherlands and, you know, to go into Paris and... You know, I, these are places that I always dreamed of going to. So, you know, we're going to just go over there and, and just have fun. I hope we don't die before the tour is over because there's a lot of shows. And I'm not as young as I used to be. I don't care. I mean, in my mind, we feel if I can be on stage playing mm -hmm. and doing what I love, mm -hmm. you know, I, I could die right then and I would be the happiest man in the world because to me, yeah. success isn't about money. It's about doing what you love and what you have a passion for. Right, right. And, right. you know, that's what I believe in with all my heart. And if my last day on earth I can be playing music, you know, I'm good to go. And I think the older you get, too, Lucille, you, a lot of people take, take opportunities for granted, you know. But I think the older you get, the more you uh, appreciate when something happens. You have to enjoy the moment. You know, yeah. to me, there's a special yeah. saying. Uh, William, he says, expectations is the root of all heartache. Yes, it's a very good sentence. Isn't that a great statement? Yes, yes. Isn't that a great statement? Yeah. So in my mind, do what you love and don't expect anything. If you think too big, then you're just going to, you know, you're going to be heartbroken. Right. Because you know? you've built right. yourself up for yeah. failure, you know. So you gotta keep a level head. <laughs> I just always love that. I wish I would have invented that statement, but I think of William Shakespeare said that. Yeah, it's profound, actually. You know, I, I really appreciate the fact that we're able to go to Europe. And you know, if I was a young man, it might not be a big deal. Honestly, you know, big deal. I'm going to Europe. You know, but at this point in my our lives, we're just very thankful that our music uh, stayed strong enough to be able to, you know, get somebody to bring us to Europe, you mm -hmm. know, and I can't wait to go come to Rome and, you know, and, and you come down. I'd love to meet you sometime, but it'd be great to meet you in Italy. You will meet me in London anyway, because I will be there for your gig. You come into London? I love yes, that. Yes, yes, so we I can meet there. I, there and, I, and I think that in the future we can plan some gigs around here. The next tour, I, I Yeah, I next tour, I, next I, tour. Thank you very much, Frank. I will see you in London. I will see you in London. Thank you so much. I, I, you know, Thanks to you. Just okay. Have a great day, all right? You too. Thank ciao. you. Thank ciao, you, Frankie. Ciao, ciao, ciao. A presto. Ciao. ciao, ciao. <laughs> bye bye.